Hey, thank you so much for joining me on the study. Today I have a very amazing guest, D1. Now you're gonna learn all about him. I am inspired by his greatness, just his grind, his motivation, his humility. I had something years ago where I was playing with the letter R and couldn't really come up with what I wanted to say. And then he came out with his music and he started using these R's and you actually have it on your shirt today. Tell me about that. Be real, be righteous, be relevant. That's that's my motto, that's my slogan. That's, that's my baby right there, bro. Right. That's my mission encapsulated into three bold statements that I'll describe uh, how, I, how I chose to live my life uh, long before the world knew who D1 was. Right. You know, and powerful. everything I do, man. That's powerful. Now tell the people where you're from. Yeah, so I'm from New Orleans, Louisiana, the 504, the Big Easy, the uh, the Crescent City, the Boot, all that. Yeah. <laughs> and I know they could tell with the accent. Man, I, I, I hope so, bro. They uh, they say, they say we got an accent like no other, so <laughs> I hope they can hear it. Now, tell me about that as far as your accent is concerned. Like, is this something, because I have a country accent, and mm -hmm. I'm from Central Florida. Mm-hmm. And you here in my hometown today happen to fly in. So we just set this up. Mm -hmm. He figured out he was going to be here today. Literally. Last night, it was late, too. Like Literally. It was like 1130, 11, bro. Right. And so it's all God doing. Mm -hmm. And then thankful to Pastor Tony Stewart at City Life for letting us use his location. But you, when I was young, I chose my accent from my grandmother because she was from selma alabama okay and we live in florida mm -hmm. and i didn't want to talk like my teachers mm. so now tell me about your accent was it like you heard somebody talking that way and you chose it or you just said you just talking how you learn how to talk i didn't know i had an accent bro <laughs> until i went to college and people from out of town were like Man, y'all talk different, you know, <laughs> or girls being like, oh, we like how you say baby. Can you say baby <laughs> one more time for us? And I'm like, what are y'all talking about? But then you go to college and you meet people from Florida. You meet people from Georgia. You heard me? You meet people from uh, who else has a thick accent? Oh, you meet people from California with that, with that, <laughs> ugh, that super, super proper dialect. Right. And, and I was like, yeah, we got something unique uh, down in New Orleans. And that's. That's really something that uh, I was like, wow. It's it's funny how when something is is like immersed around you for your entire life, how it becomes such a part of you that you don't even you don't even realize it. And that's not just true with accents. That's true with if we immerse ourselves, you know, in the presence of God. If we immerse ourselves uh, with just a certain type of music that we're listening to, like we 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 literally start to embody that without even realizing it. Right, right. So yeah, so the, so the accent part, it was never it was never a decision that I made. Like, you know what? I'm about to talk like Lil Wayne. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm gonna do. Let me start working on yeah, my accent. Right, and you know what? Cause your accent is stronger than people mm. that I've met from New Orleans. For and right. then I've heard others. So I'm like, it's different mm. parts, I guess, different For neighborhoods sure. and yeah. different, yeah. You know, and I guess some people moving in. Now, were you born there or were you? Oh, yeah. I was born and raised in New Orleans my whole life, bro. Uh section called the East Side. East Side of New Orleans, man. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, that's a part of the Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Uh, that's downtown New Orleans. So it's really a section that um, it's the worst part of the city, uh, unfortunately. And not because of the people, but just because of uh, the poverty, the, the violence and the crime. So, yeah, um, that's where I'm from, but uh, that's motivated me to want to be like that diamond in the rough. You know, right. people definitely don't expect you to come from uh, my hood where I was raised at and be college educated, be, uh, you know, God fearing, standing on your morals, your values and your principles and out here shining your light, you know, in the world, especially in the in the in the music industry and in the entertainment industry people definitely don't expect that of you so um right i thank god shows me to to be able to take the narrow road and to show people that yeah you can't you can't box somebody in just because of the zip code that they were born in right and that's what i want you to talk to the people about is what do you do 
and kind of take me through your album titles so mm -hmm. the people who mm -hmm. are being introduced to you today they can go for on sure. itunes and get your music for sure uh i started rapping as a college student uh, i went to lsu in baton rouge louisiana and when i first started rapping i had absolutely no vision uh for why i was doing it i just wanted to uh I would say I wanted to just kind of be known for something on campus. That's mm -hmm. it. I just wanted to be known for something on campus. So I started rapping uh, really for validation from, from my peers. And when you're seeking validation from your peers, uh, it could take you down some roads that you know, that they have nothing to do with what's pleasing to God, but it's just something that you feel is gonna get the attention of your friends. And that's the road that I took at first. Uh, uh, I, had a, I had a pretty tough freshman year in college. Uh, a lot of things happened to me from um, uh, the death of one of my best friends. He got murdered back home in New Orleans to um, uh, the, the young lady I was in a relationship with. Uh, we ended up breaking up, real bad breakup. Um, she ended up you know, she ended up cheating on me, break, my first heartbreak, you know what I mean? When I got to college, um, uh, I went from being a star basketball player in college to, I mean, in high school, to getting cut from the team in college behind some, uh, some foolishness. And ultimately, I fell out with like a lot of my, uh, my close friends, you know, from New Orleans when we got on campus because my roommate, he started selling drugs uh, out of our dorm room that we were living in together. And I was just like, man, I know this is going to end bad for us. And, bro, we came to college to get away from the street element that we that we were growing up around. And he ain't even grow up in that street element at all. So I was like, bro, you have no excuse. Your parents are wealthy, my boy. Like, what are you doing? But I uh, um, ended up falling out with him and a lot of my other friends. And that's actually um, when all those things happened and I kind of hit uh, rock bottom in a lot of ways. That's actually when, uh, thankfully, uh, I was able to find God mm. and I was able to uh, not just have a relationship. Uh, I mean, not just have knowledge of who God was. I always knew who God was. I grew up going to church. I grew up Catholic. Uh, so I did all the all the rituals, all of the first communion uh, in second grade, confirmation in eighth grade, going to catechism every Sunday, you know, all that stuff. But it wasn't until college that uh I formed my own relationship with, with God and I, and I started to actually study the word of God and have knowledge of like, oh, okay, I understand why I was created. I understand why I was given these certain gifts. So all of a sudden, that same gift that I had of rapping, I was like, this actually has purpose now. This has potential to change people's lives because I could speak life into these people through my words and through my lyrics. And I just chose to do that in a nutshell. I, I chose to take that road. So uh, my first ever, I mean, I put mixtapes out uh, when I was in school. You know, I, I would put free mixtapes out, pass them out around campus. But um, uh, if you go online, my first ever album, uh, the title of my first official album is David and Goliath. Mm. David and Goliath, because my first name is David. Um, and I always felt a connection with David in the Bible. I always felt like that story of him being so brave and being willing to take on Goliath and not only taking on Goliath, but defeating Goliath, you know, not just defeating Goliath, but defeating Goliath using a gift that was unique to him. Everybody wasn't gifted with that slingshot like David was, but David knew like, yo, I've been a beast with this slingshot because I've been, I've been out here in the field killing lions and bears and all this type of stuff. So y'all think I need a sword and this armor and this shield to battle Goliath? Nah, I just need my slingshot, you know? That's always so powerful to me. So first album, David and Goliath. Um, and I really viewed the music industry as a Goliath that I was ready to take on. I was like, if I'm gonna get into this game, uh, it's the Goliath of everybody thinking you got to change and you got to conform to what they want in order for you to make it. And I was like, nah, I'm going to be that David. I'm going to use my special slingshot, my special gift that I know I have that since it's from God and I'm using it for God's uh, glory, I'm going to use that to go ahead on and, uh, and, and, and tackle this Goliath and prove that I can 
still make it and be influential and still have a powerful platform and a powerful message in my music that I don't have to water down. So that's the first album. And, um, and it was important to me that I was like, God, if I'm supposed to rap, you know, please, like, let me blow, like, elevate me, give me, you know, give me a platform that continues to grow and grow. And if I'm not supposed to rap, God, then please let me know ASAP because I don't want to waste this one life that I get down here chasing something that you don't even want me to, you know, be doing. So it was really important to me. And also, I wasn't desperate. So I was like, God, if I'm not supposed to be rapping, um, let me know because I had a job as a teacher. I was a middle school teacher. So I was like, I don't need, you know, some people say, man, if it wasn't for rap, I'd be dead or in jail right now. You know, like, that's all I had. Not me. You know, I had other options, bro. And and I was exercising those options. And I was being uh, I was being influential in the field of teaching. The only issue was I started to feel restricted by the classroom, you know. And I was like, man, this teaching is great. But having to teach in these four walls and having to not have full control of how I want to teach and how I want to curate this uh, this learning experience for my students, that started to feel very uh, limiting. And so I just felt like rapping gave me a much broader platform to be able to teach. Mm, that's powerful. Now, David and Goliath. What's some other albums? Is that the, that's not the only one? Oh right? no, indeed, that's the fir- that's the some first. Other titles. Yeah, 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 that's the first one. So you got David and Goliath. Then you know I'm I'm a rapper and I'm coming up in the era of mixtapes being real, real, real prevalent, right? So I'm putting out mixtapes in between releasing albums. So you got David and Goliath, my first official album. As far as mixtapes that I have, I have a mixtape called "I Am Who I Am," mm-hmm. uh, mixtape called "I Hope They Hear Me," Volume One. Then I hope they hear me volume 1.5. Mm-hmm. Then I hope they hear me volume 2. Mm-hmm. I hope they hear me volume 2 changed my life. Mm-hmm. That mixtape blew up. Uh, one of my music videos from on there went viral uh, for a song called J50 and Wheezy. Mm-hmm. Actually, J50 and Wheezy, the song is on my David and Goliath album. Funny story, the song didn't blow up when the album came out. But sometimes, you know, we, we, we feel something in our spirit and we know that is, is, is God speaking to us. And, and legit, uh, something kept telling me for two years after that song came out, man, shoot a music video for that song, J50 and Wheezy. That song is special. It didn't really blow up on the album, but shoot a music video for us. So two years after that, I put that same song on a new project. I hope they hear me volume two. Shot a music video for it. Music video went viral. Music video completely changed my life it, it 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 captured the attention of the whole hip-hop industry i remember we met around that time yeah yeah and we talked and through twitter and then we talked mm-hmm. and it was not long after that I, I i started promoting your music like on twitter and okay. I, I put my son on it mm. and then it was not long after that you you called me it was like hey bro my video got put on MTV Jams. They, wow. Bro, we met that long ago? Yeah. You said, bro, my video got put on MTV Jams. And you actually said, man, thanks to you. <laughs> bro, you serious? <laughs> yeah. Because I had tweeted it. And I didn't, I, it wasn't thanks to me, but uh-huh. that's what you said, trying to make me feel good. <laughs> but at that time, what year was that? Like, Bro, that had to be maybe 2011. Yeah. And my, at that time, I was the 25th most influential black man on Twitter. What? When it, it was just, it was a site that was big back then called Black Web 2.0. All right. And they went to the other sites that used to be out there, like Clout was a site. Uh-huh. And you know how they would grade your Twitter mm-hmm. based on your retweets. Mm-hmm. So they take the amount of followers. Mm-hmm. So it's like, if you got 10 followers and you send a tweet and you get five retweets, mm-hmm. That's fifty percent. Yeah, that's high. And that's high. But if I got a thousand people and I send a tweet and I get ten retweets, that's, that's pretty low. One percent. Mm-hmm. And so they ranked it like that. Mm-hmm. So the biggest on Twitter was Chris Brown and Justin Bieber, and on Clout, their Clout score was ninety three. Okay. And in my space, the big people was like Rev Run. Okay. And then Tyrese came around. Okay. But their clout score was like 81 okay. and 84. Mm-hmm. My clout score was 93. Man. So I had like 
50,000, 100,000, whatever it was, but my clout score was so high. And so that's when we met around that time. And that, and I remember the phone call when you called me. You told me like, "Man, I'm on MTV Jam." Hey, thanks to you, man, because you tweeted my thing. Bro, that <laughs> but is. I was like, "Nah, you you had put in the work, man." And what? that was my favorite video too, because it was wow. like, and that's what made me respect you so much because you name dropped them, mm -hmm. and it's like, okay, Fifty Cent from G Unit, mm -hmm. like he got shot in the face nine times, or mm -hmm. what, how many other times he got shot. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and then Lil Wayne, mm -hmm. a legend. Mm -hmm. No, who was, was 50? 50, Jay-Z, and, and, and Lil Wayne. And Weezy. And, mm -hmm. and then Jay-Z. Mm -hmm. And so for you to name drop them, put like the cutout face of them on the video, I think you had mm -hmm. like cutout faces. Yep, you remember. I was like, man, this dude bold. Yeah. And, and for me being a Christian, mm -hmm. and people always looking at Christians as soft mm -hmm. and weak. Mm -hmm. So for you to like mention these guys, mm -hmm. I know at that point, if they didn't know you already, mm -hmm. I knew at that point they knew exactly who you were. Definitely. Definitely. And that made that that got my respect. Yeah, thank you very much, bro. Um, thank you for changing my life, my brother. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't me, but that was, you know. I, all the success to you. No, man. it wasn't know. me at all. But that's what that's yeah. when we met, right around wow. that time. And then I took your music and put it in my son life. Oh, okay and so you actually started helping me wow. raise him wow bro because it gave him something positive to look up to mm. and then you was humble mm. and when we would talk and i think you, you sent him like a birthday video i remember that you know i remember that bro like my memory and i've never smoked a day in my life i've actually never you know the things that they say oh yeah that make your memory cloudy Maybe it's just that I do so much that, you know, I, it, I'm i enjoying hearing this, bro, because I'm like, wait, I don't remember that. And, and, right. But it's crazy because I don't remember it until you say it, and then it just, it finds it somewhere in my memory bank. Like, right. wow, I remember all that stuff, bro. And uh, I guess just it makes sense to tell you right now, like, how much I appreciate uh, people along the way that have opened, you know, that have opened doors to where, it's not even God has put people into my life who wouldn't even be the the stereotypical people that you would think would would contribute to a rapper's you know uh, forward progress. You thinking that it's gonna be another rapper that's gonna contribute. You know you thinking that it's gonna be a record label executive that's gonna contribute. You're not thinking it's gonna be a public speaker. It's gonna be a, a dude that is a man of God in his own right, an author that is just like man. I respect this cat, and not only do I respect him, but um, you know I'm. I'm I'm not claiming to be uh Dame Dash or, or P. Diddy or anything, but I'm gonna go ahead on and, and, and put a stamp on and co sign, you know, his music. Like mm -hmm. that means a lot, bro. Like that means a lot. And and I say that because uh there's really been no blueprint that um when I look at things that I'm like, oh yeah, so here's exactly what I did and how I did it and and this wasn't all strategy, bro. The only strategy for me was just try to follow Christ and and even that follow Christ but still be authentic to to who I am so don't don't feel like oh I gotta hide the fact that I used to be a teacher or I gotta hide the fact that all of my songs aren't you know worship type songs per se I'm talking about like you said I'm going at cat's neck you know what I mean with my first big single um and 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 knowing that I might not all the way fit into anybody's box, um, that that has been just a choice that I made from early on. And man, I'm I'm just thankful for people like you, bro, that have that have helped. Uh, because I told God, I'm like God, if you don't want me to do this, just let me know, and and I'll be in somebody's classroom teaching, you know. Uh, and that was over a decade ago, bro. Mm. And Man, life is way different now than it was back then, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I remember, and so for those of you who this is your first episode, one of my goals with the study is to sit down with people who inspire me, people I've met along my journey, and I've gleaned some things from them. And your humility, I believe I was in New Orleans, and I can't remember for what, but you, you was driving like a – it was it like a gold Honda or? It was a 1998 Honda Accord, bro. Yeah, bro, yeah, you got you, a great memory, yeah. bro. You had like a little Honda and the Honda Accord, and oh. it was real chill. Yeah, uh, it was real hoopty-ish. Yeah, was, and we went to 
your apartment. Yeah, you and, and your, your, you had a duel with you. Yeah, you we was in your apartment, and it wow. was like maybe you had a roommate. Yeah, I had a roommate, and bro. You had your Bible out there, and wow, it was real bro. humble, you know, <laughs> living quarters. <laughs> And I was like, man, this dude really. <laughs> he, he putting it nicely. In hey, the grind. He putting it nicely. He <laughs> said it was humble living quarter. Y'all know what that translated no, into. No, it's but like, I can't remember like where we were, like uh -huh. if it was an apartment complex or yeah. what. But I just remember being in there and thinking like, this feel like the trenches. Mm. Like it wasn't <laughs> like, but not like the trenches, like the slums. <laughs> right. But it felt like a valley experience yeah yeah like it felt like you could have what you could have done is at that age you could have done what a lot of us do and go in to get a lot of debt mm. any car dealership will mm -hmm. give you any car you know any car under a hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars you could get in it with no income verification mm -hmm. and that's the type of stuff i would do mm. but here you were driving mm -hmm. this honda mm -hmm. that looked it looked look like it was paid for yeah uh, definitely i've never had a car note in my life you yeah. see what i'm saying yeah. and that is that's greatness yeah that's maturity on another level mm. i've always had a car note mm. right mm. now i still love cars yeah <laughs> I, i've got a lot of car notes right now and so that right there that's what inspires me just like that strength to say i'm gonna do what makes sense to me Mm -hmm. And I'm not gonna try to force to fit in because you could have got in a Benz for sure, and for sure you could have got a bunch of credit cards for sure, got that money off the cards, yeah, and went and got in a high rise in yeah. downtown New Orleans, yeah. And I, I never, man, I, I never wanted to be portraying a lifestyle that I knew uh, I couldn't really afford, you know. And I always felt like if I have to, if I have to finance my whole lifestyle, you know, then clearly I can't afford that life and now I have to I have to wear a size 22 shoe that is reserved for Shaquille O'Neal meanwhile I'm sitting here like bro my feet uh definitely way smaller than that boy I, I need a 10 10 and a half maybe you know what I'm saying like come on man and and I just I just realized that wearing shoes that fit you just feels so much more comfortable you know and uh you know, you, you say it felt like the trenches and it felt like the valley, you know, that you were in, uh, like like the valley season. I used to call that apartment um, Hustler's Headquarters, mm. you know what I mean? Because I was just like, I don't want to be too comfortable in here. Like, I literally don't want to be comfortable. I want to come here and I want to feel like, man, I got to make I got to make some hit songs today. Or I got to make some power moves because I got to get up, you know, I got to get up out this thing. And um. Yeah, who man came a long way since then, bro. I'm not gonna lie, like came a long way since then. But that mindset really hasn't left me. And and two things that I think of, one is the desire that I uh that I have had has been to just focus on how I can impact people and 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 grow my platform in order to impact people. It's never been a desire to really like have material things it has never tony bro like i promise you bro i mean you know it's a lot of things i can have right now that i don't have but it's not that i can't have them it's literally by choice and and i'm just like hey it's one thing to be like i'm grinding so that i could get to the point where i can get these material things but i'm like that's really not the stuff that matters to me what matters to me is having the platform and the ability to say something that resonates with a 15 year old that resonates with a freshman in college that's gone through hell like I was going through you know and as long as I got the platform and 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 I got the credibility just off of the skill set and, and the authenticity that person who needs my voice or needs my music man them people don't care if I got Balenciaga shoes on man them people don't care if I got a Cuban link chain on. Them people don't care what kind of car I drive, man. And that's the difference is I never wanted an audience or a fan base that was into what I had externally. I wanted them to be into what I had internally. Mm -hmm. So I would go out my way and purposely say, man, you know what? I'm going to purposely not have the external stuff that y'all expect me to have. And I'm going to be that dope and that relatable that you're still going to be like, I'm still riding with you, D. Mm -hmm. Period. 
Right. That's deep. That's yeah, deep. bro. Like, like, like on purpose. Like, like I, I enjoy being a person that, that people in New Orleans could be like, man, that boy on MTV Jams, that boy making the top 20 countdown out of, out of videos in the whole country. But wait, he just hopped out of 1998 Honda Accord. <laughs> like, wait, what's going on? And normally people look at that like, oh, huh, everything ain't what it seems, man. You think people doing good, but they really hurting. But it's like, nah. And it's like, I. I want y'all to know. Oh no, trust me. It, it we ain't hurting over here. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? But I'm doing this to mess your head up to bring about a paradigm shift to where you realize that your wealth doesn't have to be. If, if you choose, if you love cars, if you love jewelry, if you love certain things, man, by all means, as long as you're not going into debt or living above your means, man, get that stuff. You know what I mean? If that's for you. But it, I don't want you to feel like it has to be for you because growing up. As a black man, it just felt like, huh, the definition of what I have to like, is, especially in New Orleans, the home of Birdman, the number one stunner, bling, bling. It feels like, man, I got to, man, my neck didn't turn green so many times, bro, from <laughs> buying the fake chains, you know what I mean, coming up. Because it's like, man, we in New Orleans, man, like, we got to be iced out. Like, that's a part of who we are. So I'm going to the middle of the mall, buying those chains neck green you know all this type of earrings like oh man what's going on and i had to get to the point where i where i was like nah bro like let me take this chain off let me rinse my neck off you know what i'm saying and let me still look at myself and say boy you still a star you know what i mean even even without that chain on like that ain't even really you know for me and i had to be okay with that bro and i i feel like there's a there's a way to empower others to um to, to have the freedom and the liberty to to be themselves and and I think life is better that way when when you when you're not spending your whole life trying to conform into this real narrow definition of what cool is right. or what success looks like because as soon as you finally get that and you and you 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 know you you you, you switch a little bit of this and you tweak a little bit of that and you do everything that's necessary to seem cool or successful I promise you bro once you, I, I promise whoever's watching this, once you get to that point, the definition, the goalpost is going to be then moved <laughs> to where they're like, oh, we ain't on that no more they're anyway. Right. Oh, you got that? You got them shoes? They're right. Bro, that was last year. They're you know right. what I mean? Now you need this. Oh, you live in that neighborhood? Nah, this is the cool neighborhood over here now. They're right. And bro, it, it, next thing you know, you're going to be, you're going to be then lived your whole life and you, you'll never be able to say you experienced inner peace. Right. You know? Man, you know what? That's like the wisdom, you know, like sage wisdom. And you you got the the cool hair, you know, like mm-hmm. I see the guys who giving the wisdom online, like the Indian guy with the long yeah, beard. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. You know, and they sitting over there and they got the kind of look like a bed sheet on, yeah. you know, and they deep. But here you saying something that is so real, but we don't hear it enough. And it's like I resonated I resonate with that because I have everything. Mm. I never show it online. Mm-hmm. And I remember my sister asked me cuz where we come from same type of thing. Mm-hmm. She said, "Tony, why you got all this stuff and you never show it online?" Mm. And I said, "Because I have it for me, mm. not for anybody else." Mm. So like when you go on my Instagram page, you would not know that I have like 10 cars Mm -hmm. you wouldn't really you wouldn't see any of my cars Mm -hmm. but i love cars Mm -hmm. and that's kind of for me it's like my outlet it's like my sanctuary Mm -hmm. my book ideas come in my car Mm. my speeches practice in my car Mm -hmm. and i never talk about it until i'm in a real conversation you Mm -hmm. know Mm -hmm. and even like what i picked you up in a lot of times people think i rent that sprinter wow and but i did that because that was a goal of mine Hmm. but what you saying to me is it's like over the last month or so, I've been feeling a moving in my spirit to like sell a lot of my cars. Okay. And to go down to one main car for me. Okay. And to use that money that I would be spending Mm -hmm. to use it in other ways. Come on. Because I've reached that pinnacle Hmm. and experienced it. Yeah, yeah. And, And when you experience it, like what you say, it don't like change you or make you better. Mm-hmm. Like it doesn't complete you or satisfy you. Wow. It's like, man, okay, it's a cool experience. I wow. have a Bentley, 
Wow. I have a Maserati. Mm -hmm. I have a G Wagon. Mm -hmm. That's my wife's G Wagon. Mm -hmm. But I have these cars. I got the, the Red Eye. Mm -hmm. What all the SRT, what all the rappers talking about. Oh, okay. Mine, 807 horsepower. Wow. But it does, it has not made me happier. Wow. Bro, I'm so glad we're having this conversation, bro, because um, there's people who are going to, like, this is, yeah, this is fire right here because there's people who are going to relate to my perspective of, like, man, I never had any of that stuff that you're talking about. Um, you know, could have it, you know what I mean? But literally just never even, it never even aroused me, you know what I'm saying? It never never aroused me, and it's like I'm, 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 I'm cool on it. Um, it's so great to hear someone who is like, man, I worked just as hard as you, D, and I can have all the stuff, and I do have it. You know what I mean? And here's what having it feels like, because some people feel like, well, I bet if you had it, though, D, I bet you wouldn't be sitting there saying the same thing, you know? And it's like, well, my brother got it, you know? Like, God, we on the same mission. God God told him to go get it all, so that his light-skinned brother is like, man, tell me what it's like. And to hear you sit here and say, like, Yo, this is something that, you know, it's not like it's made you a better person per se. And it, and 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 I think that that's uh I think that's powerful, bro, for people to hear. Um and I think there's something about the there's something about the the brevity of um of of life and 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 the the uh the absoluteness of the fact that we won't be here one day that that makes it to where it's like what do we want to pass on? And I just think that, uh, you know, as far as wisdom and as far as life skills, it's funny, I was a life skills teacher, you know, uh, in school. And passing on life skills mm. to people is uh, is something that can come about from either just a, a, an enhanced perspective that we have that we need to share with others or it can come about from life experiences that we've had that we're like, hey, I know firsthand what this is like and because of this i can help to um i can help to pass this knowledge on that like if you want these things for for how it's gonna make you feel or thinking it's gonna change you in any way i can tell you from life experience uh here's the reality that stuff won't and i think mm -hmm. i think that that can help to bring about like a, a a paradigm shift man to where to where we just get back to the basics bro um mm -hmm. and, and and people hopefully don't you know just because you can do something that's the true essence of power is you you have so much power that you can do something to people you can drop a nuclear bomb on them you can if you are bigger than somebody you can inflict you know physical harm on them but that power is even more like valuable when it's like hey I'm not gonna abuse the ability that I have uh, mm -hmm. just because I have it. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like I'm a, I'm gonna, I'm gonna channel that energy in other ways. Just know, don't play with me, cause I could, I could go drop 250k on a car tomorrow. You know what <laughs> I mean? But, but I'm a, I'm gonna use that power and that wisdom to, yeah, to 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 bring about like a different uh, end result from the fruit of my labor and mm -hmm. whatnot. I think that's awesome, bro. Like. I, I, yeah. man, that's and awesome. I think a lot of times too when we get to that space of materialism we will like when I think about selling my cars the the next thought is this person right here gonna think I fell off oh and, and so, you deal with that and, okay. then, and then it'll make you be like nah, I gotta keep it cause <laughs> this, this, this person gonna be happy thinking I fell off and we don't believe what you saying you see what I mean? Like when you come from the bottom, mm -hmm. people we don't believe it. But like if Mark Zuckerberg mm. say, and I believe it because I know you, mm -hmm. and I also know how smart you are, mm -hmm. and I know that you know how credit works. Mm -hmm. So this is the crazy thing: when I I done had foreign cars since I was probably twenty two, okay, twenty three. Mm -hmm. This is the first Benz me and my wife got. I probably was. 22 okay it was like a c class mm -hmm. and went to a dealer it was twenty two thousand mm -hmm. dollars and i was just so lost and ignorant i traded in a paid off honda civic mm -hmm. that my wife had mm -hmm. to get in that bins because of what i come from yeah bro and that's what i want to get into because what you talking it's that ain't normal 
Hmm. When you of when you a minority, yeah, for sure. And when you come from a little or nothing, yeah, it's not normal at all. It's so foreign. Yeah. This what you talking is like what the financial guys will teach after, after. they have had all the millions, <laughs> got all, and they still got nice cars. It yeah. was a, it's a financial teacher. I ain't gonna say their name, but I was talking to one of their mentees, and I was like, man, this guy teaching this, this, and that. I'm like, man, I got a Maserati. I like my Maserati. He was like, oh, such and such got two of them. For I'm real. like, so how you got two Maseratis? And he telling people, you know, drive a paid off car. And, yeah. But but it was like he had experienced all of that. Mm. And then I think they said the guy had like a 20,000 square foot house. Wow. And so it was like he living in the lap of luxury. Okay. But all of the followers is like eating bread. Mm. And, and baked beans mm. and so it, it was kind of unfair to me for somebody to have the lap of luxury mm -hmm. but then telling everybody else to go through this sacrificial season like what you have chosen yeah to be in so yeah. i want to understand like who taught you that lesson yeah and like what age did that dawn on you yeah uh i went to ghana west africa as a teenager bro i was either 13 or 14 years old and going to Ghana and being around it is 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 so amazing, man, how life works. Because uh before that, same thing, bro. I definitely didn't grow up with a lot at all and I definitely wanted it all just to, you know, to flash it in the face of my haters and just, you know, the whole narrative, bro, like just all that. Couldn't wait to get it to actually make me feel like somebody. And I got selected to go to Ghana, West Africa on this cultural exchange trip. I ended up spending three weeks out there and being around those students who were my same age uh, from Ghana who had absolutely nothing physically, you know, compared to what we have over here. Material possessions had absolutely nothing. I'm talking about their mothers had to walk miles upon miles each morning just to get clean water, you know, and, and balance like this big... 10 um like circular joint on their head that's like this huge and they would they would fill it up with with fresh water from the stream and balance it bro the thing had to weigh 30 40 pounds you know what i'm saying and and these women elegantly balanced this on their heads and walking back miles because they couldn't they weren't physically strong enough i'm like how is that not giving you a headache you know what i'm saying like that's crazy but seeing all this and seeing that despite living like that, despite just to get a high school education, these students had to leave their families and go to boarding school. You know what I mean? Boarding school just to get what's equivalent to a high school education for us. Seeing these uh, these students, man, we went over there with clothes that we would have gave away to Goodwill. You know what I mean? And we went over there and gave, man, they going crazy over these clothes. You would think we was giving them Christian Dior. You heard me? Like, like, and Louis Vuitton and, and, and just... I'm like, man, this is uh, amazing how appreciative they are of the little things. But meanwhile, they had something that they couldn't just give to us the way we were giving tennis shoes and giving clothes to them and giving jewelry to them. They had something that wasn't just able to say, here, here you go, because it's something that came from within the heart. And that was joy that radiated from within. That was inner peace, you know. That was an appreciation for the things in life that money literally cannot buy at all. And they had it, and it radiated from them, Tony. Like, it, it literally became something that I was envious of. I'm like, man, I want that. I want to feel like this student who's my same age when I wake up in the morning. Because I wake up in the morning, and, like, I'm, I'm, I'm cool. It's another day, a regular day, just out here living man that little dude got something that i don't have man he he has something that i want bro life just seemed better with whatever it is that he has and man that's that's what started me on my journey bro that's what started me on my journey to get that and now what took you to ghana was that a school trip or yeah trip? It's, yeah no it was a uh, man my kindergarten and first grade teacher her name is miss harley right miss harley was my teacher miss harley started there's a black woman in New Orleans, she's an amazing visionary. This queen had the foresight to say, I want to give these New Orleans students from public schools, you know what I mean, from the inner city, an opportunity to see more. Because when you see more, now you have the motivation to be more, you know. So she was able to 
put all the uh, all the X's and O's together, connect all the dots to where we were able. First of all, it was a selection process, so you had to write an essay, you had to get teacher recommendations. I had a plug though, cause she used to be my teacher. So she started this organization. All the students in the whole city of New Orleans could apply for it, but out of everybody who applied, they would pick like 12 to 15 students to go there. Um, I got picked, and after you got picked, we had to wash cars, you know, any, everything to raise money, selling candy, like just, unless your family just had it like that. We ain't have it like that. So did everything, bro, to get a few bucks here, a few bucks there. Um, and ultimately we paid that money uh, that, it, that it costed for me to be able to um, go out there, bro. Mm. Changed my life. You know what? So one of the selfish things that I'm doing with this podcast is, and it's really how I've built my brand online, is my, my messages went viral, but I was writing quotes for me. Mm. Like it was God talking to me. Come on. And I would share it as a tweet. Mm. And it would go viral, and I think because it was talking to other people. Mm -hmm. And so me doing this podcast is like to help me grow. I can and, tell, bro. I can tell, yeah. that, I can tell that you, I can just tell that that's how, and that's a great, formula bro i could tell that though like you you're you're a leader to so many but i can literally feel from you that you're like d i'm sitting here soaking up everything you're saying because this ain't finna do nothing but refill my tank you know what i mean because i'm pouring into so many people i can literally feel that from you bro right because that's the thing it's like we can't stop growing mm. and it, and it's like we all may be good in an area and then weak in another area and it's and that's where I'm trying to with the study, like grow in those areas I'm weak in, knowing that this conversation we having, it's liberating me because I also know it's gonna liberate a million people. Mm. By the by the time we die, I hope this have at least a million views. Yeah. Lord. And mm. I said to my wife like two days ago, I said, babe, I think I'm gonna sell everything. Because when I think about it, I'm like, I want to be at 65 to where I could sit down and never have to do nothing. If I don't want to talk to anybody online. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, what I'm spending on car notes, mm -hmm. if I put that on the market mm -hmm. in my SEP IRA mm -hmm. or and then into a tax, even a taxable account, this will be $10, 20000000 million when I'm. 65 straight up i'm like i could travel the world straight i could up. shut down my youtube if i want to yeah. i leave it up but yeah. i could just and so the lord hit me you can't serve god and mammon mm. and then a lot of time we'll tell ourselves oh i'm doing this for me mm -hmm. but it's like if we only live for ourselves we'll be naked in the garden of eden but we really do a lot of stuff for other people mm. so it's like if i'm doing this for me I've got my feel of those experiences mm, mm -hmm. if I'm doing it for me. If I hold on to it, knowing that I'm full, then I'm doing it for somebody else. Wow. And that's really what, what hit me right here. And, but I want, I want to dig a little deeper because I want to know about who raised okay. you. I want to dig a little deeper. You got time? Yeah. Okay. I want to dig a little deeper because I feel like it's small seeds, just like the mustard seed, mm -hmm. that really birth a person. Mm -hmm. And as much credit as you could take for your success, and as much as we can give to God, somebody had to raise you, like a, a village had to raise you. So Definitely. I wanna know like, from the age of five, you know, to 10, a memory that you remember to this day mm -hmm. good or bad mm. yeah yeah i remember the age of five i remember um it would have been april 4th because that's my grandpa's birthday uh and my birthday is six days later april 10th and i remember that at the age of five us being outside in the hot new orleans heat on his birthday and him teaching me how to ride a bike with no training wheels and the whole family was gathered at their house uh, for his birthday to celebrate him. And on a day where he's supposed to be getting celebrated, he's outside teaching me how to ride my bike with no training wheels. And I just remember 
it didn't click to me at the time, but as I got older, and I remember the joy I felt when I finally got the hang of it. Like, look at me, Papa, like, I'm, I got it with no training wheels. I got it. And I remember seeing beads of sweat, you know, falling from his face and everything. And it definitely took us several hours out there for me to, for the, for me to get it mastered. Um, and of all days, that's just, you know, that's the life of a five-year-old. That's the day I chose to want to learn. Like, Papa, teach me today. Teach me today. And he did it. Um, I think about how... Uh, humble and and how much uh, uh, selflessness you know and act like that took man um, and I was just I was blessed that I've been raised by people who who had that that mindset that headspace I think about being uh, a little older and my mama you know uh, she the first one in our family to graduate from college um, and she taking night classes you know while I'm in school, me and my little sister, and she taking night classes. So I'm in the I'm in the college library with my little sister. We doing our homework uh, as elementary or middle school students, and she in the classroom, you know, a couple doors down, taking night classes to go ahead on and get her degree, you know. And I remember attending her graduation, and just being like, wow. And then for me, the standard was set. I never, I never didn't picture myself graduating from college you know and i became the first man in our family to graduate from college you know um i think about just people like that man who who made those uh who made those intentional moves to uh make my life better mm. you know and that took a lot of selflessness and you say how you say that papa papa yeah papa, papa. papa. <laughs> yeah so now tell me because louisiana has a lot of different culture <laughs> yeah. like i hear about creole and i hear about you know i was just doing another interview in new orleans but you was out of town mm -hmm. and the young lady i was talking to she was like a mixture of uh native american black white all of that what tell me like your mom and was yeah. your grandfather was that her dad that taught you how to ride the bike? so i i never met anyone on my mom's uh side of the family in terms of her parents her her mom passed away before i was born and her dad uh i don't think she knew him too well and i think he yeah i i, I think she knew of him and it had a, a a, a form of a relationship with him but not uh not anything tight so i never knew them um so i only knew my my daddy's side of the family so my grandparents when i talk about mama papa you know my grandparents they basically they shared me as a as a as a child growing up with my parents so i it it was like 50 50 input that they that they had into contributing to who david augustine is who d1 is um definitely my you know my my grandparents they whole side of the family everybody light skin everybody super light skin and it's like it ain't even like whiteness. It's just light skin breeding with more light skin, which produces double light skin, then quadruple the light skin, then eight times the light skin. It just was like generations of that. And I'm sure they had some white in the, in the family, but like down the line, you know what I'm saying? Because my grandparents, both black, both just real light skin. Um, uh, both of their parents, you know, uh, they both have black sets of parents, both just real light skin. I think it might be maybe my grandparents' grandparents, where maybe some white was at, or my grandparents' great-grandparents, where some whiteness mm -hmm. came into play. And my mama, my mama looked like you, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. Um, um, one interesting story, bro, that I, that I, uh, yeah, one interesting story that I take pride in is, um, man, I found out that basically my grandpa and my grandma they both had family members who uh, lived as what we call passe blanc. And passe blanc is a French term for saying you're passing for white. Mm -hmm. You're so light skinned that in the Jim Crow era, in the, you know, in the civil rights era, uh, in the post slavery era, um, you're so light skinned that if you want to, if you want to have an easier life and whatnot, you had a lot of black people who were passe blanc and they actually passed as white people. So they lived their whole life knowing that they were black, but 
uh, living life as a white person and and they blended in and nobody ever said anything. So they got the whole life experience of being white and not having to experience uh, segregation, uh, well, not having to experience discrimination uh, due to segregation and, and racism and all that stuff. Um, and that that is in my family, bro. That was in my family. My grandparents, like literally they each kind of got cut off by portions of their family because they chose to say, man, heck no, we're not finna passe blanc our way through life. We're not finna pass for white. Like, we know we black, you know what I mean? My grandpa tells me these stories, bro, about how him serving in the army, how he went to, uh, when he was getting, he was getting uh, deported out to, I think, Germany or wherever he had to do his basic training there before he served time in Germany. And they had a little card that they had to fill out and you had to put your uh, your race on the card. And he checked the box that said Negro. And he said a man looked at him and was like, oh, uh, yeah, everything looked good on your paperwork. You checked the wrong box, though. You know, uh, man, you, man, you checked Negro. Go ahead and put white on there. And my grandpa was like, no, that ain't no mistake, man. I'm black. He said, that ain't no mistake. And the dude looked. And he said, you sure? You sure this what you want? And my grandpa was like, what you mean? Is this what I want? This is who I am. You feel me? For me to hear stories like that, bro, God, dog. For me to for me to hear stories of them getting cut off by parts of their family, man. Like my grandpa, same thing, telling me stories of we bowl, like we love bowling. That's one of our pastimes, right? I bowled in the league for 13 years as a child. Yeah, like a like an official league, won all kind of awards and everything. Um, had the ability to go and be on a bowling team in college, all that type of stuff, man. For my grandpa to tell me stories about him being in the bowling league, the adult league, and him walking one day, and as he coming back from the bathroom, walking to his lane, he looks, and he sees a dude that looks just like his daddy. So my grandpa looking at a dude that looks like a spitting image of his daddy, to the point where his daddy was dead at this time. So it's kind of like, you know, it's like you see a ghost, like literally like, man, what the world? Look at my daddy bowling on lane 24 type stuff. And he looked. And he said he looked up on the computer screen where they have everybody's names, and he ended up putting two and two together. That was one of my grandpa's daddy's brothers that disowned him because my grandpa's daddy chose to say, man, we living as black in this house. Me and any of my descendants, we are black. But some of his own siblings were like, well, we living as white over here. So even though we blood brother, blood brothers, at the end of the day, we cutting you and any of your people off since y'all choosing to live as black. Man, to hear stories like that, bro, like, and to come from that, that's, uh, that's stuff that makes you, it makes me proud to be um, uh, a one-man army sometimes and proud to take the road less traveled, proud to be a, a, a rebel, as long as it's a rebel with a cause, you know, because my grandparents was rebels. Hmm. So now what you're saying, for one, I've never heard – I've heard of people passing as white, but I've never met anybody that mm -hmm. had a direct tie to that. Mm -hmm. And so that's like my mama, she your color, mm. which is ironic. Wow. My mama, your color. Wow. And she could be a shade lighter. Mm -hmm. And then my dad is my color. Mm -hmm. And then my mom's mom is my color. Wow. Probably like a shade or two darker. Wow. So what we kind of uncovering here is just like the beauty and the range mm -hmm you know, of black people, like mm -hmm. how just so many different shades. Mm -hmm. But now did that, you hearing those stories, is that, did that play into inspiring your hair? Because hmm. India hmm. remade the hair thing big. Mm -hmm. uh, what, who was it, like Chris Rock or somebody did the he thing sure on did. good hair or yeah, something? Yeah, he sure did. And not because you, with your hair, mm -hmm. what I would anticipate, like me being in Florida, a lot of people have, what we used to call dreads. Mm -hmm. When I say dreads, now people say, Tony, it's not dreads because dread come from dreadful. Mm. It's locks. Mm -hmm. And so it became like political. Right. It became a statement. Right. Bob Marley, you know, with yeah. his hair. Yeah. And so I want to get to the root of your decision and mm -hmm. what played into you, you know, locking up and staying that way. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually not deep at all. Uh, <laughs> Lil Wayne. <laughs> Lil Wayne had dreadlocks, bro. That was my favorite rapper at the time. And it was Lil Wayne and it was the fact that <clears throat> I wanted to 
I wanted to say that uh, by the time I left this earth, that I had experienced every type of hairstyle that I was curious about having, you know. So I did the low cut fade. I did the curls, you know, kind of like the flat top, curly flat top. I did the bush fade, you know, the Kobe Bryant bush. Um, I did the Allen Iverson cornrows. Um, and I was like, yo, locks, you know, are are kind of like the last thing on my list that I would want to experience. Uh, and like, let me let me go ahead on and do that. And that's all. It just started out as wanting to check it off my list and also wanting to uh, wanting to prove. So this is going to get a little deeper. Um, and I guess it was a little bit of a deeper uh, issue as well. It was definitely because I was influenced heavily by Lil Wayne, number one. It was definitely because of the uh, curiosity to just, you know, have locks. Um, but then also, it was me wanting to, like, prove it to either myself or to other people that, like, that I could, uh, that, that my hair could lock up. Because it's almost like being light-skinned, bro. It, it's almost like a... Hey, you black, but you ain't black, black. You know what I mean? Like, you ain't really all the way black. Like, you got that good hair or whatever. And for me, uh, I never experienced, like, the the privilege that people think come along with being light-skinned. You know what I'm saying? And, like, oh, yeah, so that, that made this easier for you to be accepted or anything like that. No, I always lived, before the world knew who a D1 was, um... I grew up in a neighborhood, I went to schools, and I had friends to where I would be the only light-skinned person, you know, in the clique, in the crew. So if anything, uh, it's me kind of feeling like, dang, I don't have what, uh, what the rest of my friends have, you know, in terms of just that complexion that is uh, more prevalent, you know, in, in my hood, in my area, at, at my school. So for me, uh, I do think that that was a part of it, too, It's like, well, I'm going to have locks and that's you know it don't get more black than that <laughs> <laughs> man you know what i have to say that i really appreciate and respect your transparency mm. because in this interview you have shared some things like with your hair and earlier when you said why you started rapping mm -hmm. the root of rapping was i want to be somebody on campus mm -hmm. and that's hard to say because people will try to take it back because the way you rap i thought you've been rapping since like eight years old oh like i thought mm -hmm. this was a lifelong thing that you've been doing because actually i see people who they were rapping at eight years old but you rap better than them mm -hmm. as far as just rhythm and cadence mm -hmm. but i could see videos of certain rappers when they were kids rapping mm -hmm. And so that's what I thought you was going to try to, you know, say, mm. because that's what everybody says. But mm -hmm. you said, no, I started this in college. Mm -hmm. And that motivated me because that, that let me know you could help me produce my single. <laughs> because on, I want to do me one single okay. and then retire. Straight up. Ooh. And I got to find my voice. I need the right beat. I need the right hook. Boy, and I want it to be just speaking truth. Not, not nothing for the club, mm -hmm. but just something that somebody going to just put it on repeat and just it's going to change their life. Man. Like this interview. Yes, you know? indeed, bro. Oh, this this interview going to definitely uh, going to definitely inspire somebody to just be themselves and to know that being yourself is OK. Like you have permission to be uniquely you and and you can still succeed. You can still be cool. Um, yeah, people need that. So many people need that, bro. Uh, I want people to experience that that joy and that inner peace that, that comes along with, you know, living living a lifestyle that isn't trying to do it for others, you know, because, yeah, we, we didn't touch on a lot in this interview, bro. Mm -hmm. We didn't touch on a lot. So on the recording of this today, um, this is April 26th. Yeah. Special day for me because my oldest son, it's his birthday today. Nice. And he turns 15. Wow. And you said 15, a 15 year old earlier. So what I would love to do for one, what I'm gonna ask every adult watching this who has a child that is 
if your child is advanced, then eight years old might not be too young. If your child is just, you know, really just normal every day, not advanced on like social media, then I would say 10 years old and up make this video a required thing before they play another video game, mm. before they go into the next day, make this entire interview required viewing for them and have them write a summary from it because this right here is what we need the next generation and i'm gonna I'm boost this video i'm gonna put money behind it mm -hmm. and put like the ad dollars on social media just to get this message out mm -hmm. even more versus just trusting the algorithm okay because i want because this liberating because mm -hmm. we like you know the duality yeah you know yin and yang yeah. like we on the same mission yeah but just dealing with different things yeah and then it's it's and we could see both sides like mm -hmm. Your transparency say, hey, I did my hair because a rapper did it. Mm -hmm. And that right there is like influence of mm -hmm. a, that a rapper has mm -hmm. that a lot of times they don't claim to have. And they say, oh, I want to be a role model. Mm -hmm. But you made a whole life change. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of gigs that you missed out on, mm -hmm. like a lot of opportunities you missed out on, a lot of relationships you missed out on, a lot of friendships you missed out on because of your hair. And you didn't even know it. Hmm. Like you didn't even realize that this person was going to talk to you. Hmm. But then they was afraid of you because of a stereotype. Hmm. And so that choice that you made, just like the choice that I'm making to have cars. Mm. And I come from like where I come from that fear of like the type of people to where if you make it and you don't look out, they'll kill you. Mm. Like somebody will set you up to get robbed. Somebody will set you up to get shot. Mm. And somebody will, they, they will just make you feel so terrible if you don't give them their dream. Mm -hmm. So when I made it, man, I had to buy everybody a car. Whoa. Like I literally, if I, if I count in my head, I probably have like, I probably have 90, 120. 160 180 200 215 what? $215,000 in cars that I bought for people and I'm leaving some out and I'm forgetting some but in that and that was the prison that I Jeez. felt trapped in to where like if I don't do this I'm going to be online like, oh, Tony don't care about his family. Like how Kobe Bryant, God rest his soul, fell out with his parents over money. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people I meet. And But with what you said today, man, I want that message. And even with me, it's like I done had my fun. I had my experience. Now God showing me a ne the next level. Mm. So for the last two months, I've been getting quotes on my cars. Mm. All of them have appreciated. So it Forever. worked out. Oh, it, wow. it, it worked out. So, But I'm finna liquidate. And then go to that next stage because this right here costs money because I'm flying around the country and I'm actually going to fly around the world because mm -hmm. it's two guys in South Africa that I want to interview. Come on. Because they booked me for my first international speaking engagement. Come on. And they paid me 20, I mean, $10,000, but the trip cost 20. And the, the guy who set it up was 22 years old. Come on, man. So when I liquidate, I'm going to be funding messages like these getting to the world. And I just wanted to share that with you to say this right here, man, it's been a blessing for me. Hmm. And what I want to ask you is because my son turning 15 today and because this is going to be a required viewing for him because he already getting a shoe fetish. Hmm. And I know that's going to, that could turn into something mm -hmm. like because he already getting a shoe fetish. And I know that could turn into something. And if that's not control, Mm. What would you say to a 15-year-old or your 15-year-old self, if you weren't thinking how you are today, what would be your message to a 15-year-old young man who, my mm. son today begging me for Snapchat, mm. you know, he doesn't run social media, he doesn't have social media, he got a TikTok, but he don't post on it, he just watch the videos. What would you say to a 15-year-old in this society? dealing with this today yeah i would say that all of the material things that you want 
just know that they're not going to make you a better person. Uh, those things are not going to make you cooler. You're already cool enough. You're already dope enough. You're already fly enough. That's the one thing that I want you to know is that those things, they don't make you who you are. It's okay to like it, and it's okay to appreciate uh, what, you know, what this shoe looks like or what this name brand you know, looks like or something. Or even on social media, having a certain amount of followers, bro, that stuff does not change who you are ultimately. That stuff is a, a whole form of slavery that some people get trapped into, like literally being slaves to saying, man, I got, I got, I got these people that I got to post something to impress them. You become a slave when you're working to impress these people because you feel like, you know, you're indebted to them and you got to entertain them and your picture or your video that you post got to be dope enough for them. Nah, man, like that's that's a trap of this world right now. You're as free as you can be knowing that you're cool. You're the same dude if you had on some jeans from Walmart and having on some five hundred dollar or thousand dollar jeans. You're the same dude with some Jordan cool grays as if you just had some flip flops on. You know, what I mean, literally, you're the same dude. And I will warn you that if anyone is only willing to be your friend because you have a certain name brand, then that's not a real friend. And I want you to know that. If anybody is only willing to be nice to you or if a girl is only willing to talk to you because of the name brands that you wear or things that are superficial like that, that's not somebody that you want to be around long term. Because even if you have those things, you don't want to have people around you and you're like, dang, these people love my things just as much as they love me. Oh, shoot. These people love my things more than they love me. They love, they're, they're in love with the things that I have. Man, that, that could lead to you being very popular but feeling very lonely at the same time. Imagine that. Imagine having all the friends, all the followers. You're the homecoming king. You got all this stuff, but you still feel lonely. And it's because you can feel that energy when the people around you are just there for what you can do for them. The only thing you should have to do for anybody is just show up and be yourself. And they should be like, man, that's what's up. This is my boy right here. But if you got to do anything more than show up and be the best version of yourself, if you got to show up and pull up a certain way in a certain car with a certain name brand on, if you got to have a certain uh, image, you know, that, that, that they feel like you didn't have to build up on social media, that's pressure right there. That's pressure. And we ain't trying to have pressure in our personal relationships. We're trying to have peace. Mm, man, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you so much. I know this is God's doing that we were able to set this up. Mm -hmm. Thank you to Vega for I hit him last night, midnight, Dang. and we set this up. Dope, and uh, Pastor Tony Stewart and City Life for letting us use their amazing church mm -hmm. to knock this out. Hey, wherever you are watching this or listening to it, make sure that you lock in with us, subscribe, download, share it, and catch us every mm -hmm. week because we're gonna keep diving deeper and deeper and touching on important lessons that we need in our life. I'm Tony Gaskins, thank you so much.